I was going to go up on the stage thing, but it feels a bit disconnected up there. It's much nicer being down here. Um, but I'm going to experiment, because one of the first things I think one learns with uh, this way that we've all gathered to study and look at and, and learn about and experience is that it's a way that isn't proscribed. It's not something that is just given... Um, uh, we're, not in the, we're not in the restaurant, we're in the kitchen. That's the difference, I think. We're in the kitchen, we're working with these things. So, so, I'm, so it, it's, 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 I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go up, up, up there and see how it feels. I might feel a bit too... <laughs> Right, here. Ooh, ooh, it feels <laughs> a bit, bit, bit weird, isn't it? But uh, is it easier for you? Do you is it the sort of, do you see better? I, I get the feeling that from the back it's easier particularly. Yes, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll put up with the, the slight oddity of it for me. And because that's another thing, I think. Um, it was uh, Ernest Hemingway, I think, who had a bet with a friend that you um, could write a story in... in um, six words. There's a huge, huge competitions now with the BBC and collections and all the rest of it. And a friend of his said, no, you can't, but Hemingway won the bet because he, he, he made up a story which was a pair of baby shoes for sale, unused. And you go, oh, it's a whole story, isn't it? You know. So why did I mention that? Um, I can't, I don't know. I don't know why I mentioned it. So, there, there was a really deep connection with, with you know, uh, with this coming up on the stage, but I, I can't think of what it was. Um, uh, okay, story, story hugely important. So, so we're working with the unknown, we're taking risks, we're exploring, and I suspect that all of us here are here because we've seen beyond the veil or sensed beyond the veil. In a sense, what I think we've done is we've realized that there's more than the 4%. And the 4%, this is just such a wonderful thing. You know that 96% of the universe is dark matter and dark energy. So all this stuff that we, that we call real and that we see and that we experience and that we work with in science, scientists themselves now say, this is just 4%. It's very bizarre. I had a wonderful argument with a professor friend who's a scientist, and we tried to, we, as an experiment, we tried to see if we could convert each other, me to convert him to the spiritual worldview, he to convert me to the scientific worldview. After an hour or two, we, we gave up and we agreed we'd never, never uh, agreed to disagree. But his parting shot was, he said, you know something, Philip, you've got one thing on your side, uh, which is incontrovertible, and that's this 96% unknown thing that we scientists have stumbled on. And uh, so, so I think we're all here because we've sensed it, and I want to do a little sort of census here and see, see uh, 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 you know, how, how this falls. Um, my, my sense is that some of us will have sensed this as children that we will have had experiences that somehow indicated to us that there was another world, another reality, beyond just what seemed to appear to us. Could we have a show of hands? See, how many people feel they had those sorts of experiences? Okay, so, you know, that's, that's a lot. That's probably half, if not more, actually, yes. Then, for, for, for others of us, we would have had in our, uh, you know, when we'd grown up, had a particular uh, experience unaided by the ingestion of anything, just un unaided, just a, spon an, a natural experience. Uh, you, you catch my drift, as they say. Uh, how, how many had, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, being aware of, a, of a, a relative who's died, who's giving you a message, or having some strange out-of-body experience? One. Let's have a show of hand for sort of natural, sort of, uh, yes, a lot, a lot again. And then how many through, uh, and, and this is where you, you know, uh, uh, how, many, how many through um, w working with a plant in some way? Let's, let's look at, say, marijuana and, and smoking pot. Let's, let's be straight about this. Um, smoking pot, much, much smaller, or, or you're shy about admitting it, uh, which is fine. <laughs> and, and, um, uh, and then out of interest, the stronger experience, a psychedelic experience, um, you know, LSD or mescaline or something like that. Let's have a look. Um, 
Okay, about a third, yes, or maybe half even. Okay, ayahuasca, how many, how many people, the, the latest thing? Uh, yes, about a, a, a third. Okay, yes, no, that's, that's, that, that's very interesting, thank you. Yeah, um, so, so I think that's what, what brings us to, to events like this. We've, we've had experiences in whatever ways of the other, and, um, and, and we want to learn more. Once you, once you have a glimpse or sense or feeling or presentiment or some, sometimes a very powerful, strong experience, we want, we want to learn about it and we want to, we want to know more about it. And um, let me just have a look at my, my notes. And, uh, and of course, the focus on this conference is, um, is the land, shamanic lands. And that's a huge clue, I think, that, um, that somehow... There's a relationship between this physical world that we find ourselves in. It's not about some kind of transcendence where we're trying to reject, live a life of purity that rejects uh, the physical in order to go into some other states. That can be part of the spiritual journey, uh, but for some people at some times. But this particular approach that I think we're all interested in is one that has a different relationship to matter, the body, and the land that says really, we're here for a reason, and it can teach me. And, and I guess we've all had those experiences where we've been to particular places, sat under a particular tree, traveled to a particular island, uh, sat in a stone circle, and had experiences which range from the very odd or paranormal, if you like, to perhaps just a sense of deep peace and connection with, with life and with oneself and with the land. Uh, that, 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 is, that is powerful, and, and, so, so, and this, this conference is, is focused around that. But there's a lot of land around. There's a whole planet load of land, and we happen to be living at this extraordinary time where we have access to a great deal of it, thanks to great metal birds that fly in the sky, thanks to the travel industry. And uh, so the challenge is then... Where do we go? What land do we learn from? Um, what are we actually going to do? We learnt about in the, I suppose, what, well, from really the theosophists onwards, this wonderful image of adepts who would sit in caves in the Himalayas and they would go deep into meditation, leaving their bodies as husks in the cave and they would travel around the world doing wonderful acts of service, inspiring people and healing people and all the rest of it. And so we Westerners read about this, and we said, fantastic, I want to do that. But instead of leaving our husks, we carted our husks out to India and to all the rest of it, and, and, and we keep moving around. And, uh, but, but this reflects a bigger challenge or issue, I think, which is the challenge of globalism versus localism. And of course, it, uh, my understanding is it's not a question of rejecting the fact that there's a tremendous urge for us to become global citizens, to sense, you know, one earth, one planet, one people on one earth, which is a tremendous evolutionary uh, step, I think, that you know, many of us are, are, are working with and in tune with. But at the same time, there's the almost contrary dynamic within us, which is this yearning for home with rootedness, with connection, with community. And I think it is possible to have both. I think it's possible to feel oneself a global citizen, to learn from other cultures and traditions and so on, to travel, to go on pilgrimage, to connect with sacred sites all over the world. But I think it's equally important and perhaps a prerequisite to actually connect with that need for us to have roots, to feel at home, and to connect with the land. So it's not necessarily about ethnicity, it's not necessarily about where you were born, it's about where you find yourself, where your destiny, if you believe in reincarnation, you may well believe that you've been in many different places, but where you find yourself now at this time. And of course here, we find ourselves in London, right in the middle in one of the richest cities in the world for a study of magic and uh, I don't know about shamanism but certainly magic. Uh, the, the esoteric history of London is absolutely fascinating 
and uh, just a short walk away is the British Museum where you can go into the Enlightenment Room and see John Dee's crystal ball that he gazed into and scryed with, with Edward Kelly. And uh, there's Freemasons all just down that way and so on. So it's a place rich in history. The last time I was in here, there was a chaos magic conference going on. So this room has seen a lot of history too. So we're in a very rich place. And further afield, we're in a landscape on the British Isles. You noticed when we did those three breaths at the beginning, we were connecting with the earth beneath us, the sky above us. This is an old Celtic way of seeing things, and the, and the sea around us. And we can, it's easy to feel that because, because we're on, in Britain, and we can feel the sea around us. And, and so here, the good news is that here on these lands, in these lands, is a tremendously rich tradition that we can learn from. It's been easy to fall into the trap, I think, of seeing spiritual teachings coming from a long way, being uh, more interesting than what's actually under our nose, which is kind of human nature. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side, and the, 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 the mysterious stranger is always more interesting than the person you know quite well, and so on. Uh, however, the good news is that there's this tremendous tradition. And I was fortunate enough when I was very young to meet the old chief druid, and I studied with him from an early age. And um, the thing that uh, began, in a way, my quest that made me so interested in druidism, druidry, and what he was working with was this idea of a magical landscape that I was living in. I was living in Notting Hill Gate, uh, born in the, in the 1950s and so into the 60s. And, and um, for those of you who, who are of that era, you will know that the whole world was in black and white until about 1964 or something like that. And then somebody threw it a gigantic switch and suddenly it was in color. And, and uh, so it was kind of dreary. You know, I used to walk past bomb sites every day. I lived in Notting Hill Gate and just used to walk past bomb sites. And, and uh, then, then in the uh, early 60s, I met my druid teacher. And he introduced me to this idea of a network of sacred sites around the land. Power points, stone circles, ley lines. My grandfather knew Alfred Watkins and worked with him, so we had inherited various heirlooms associated with the old straight track club and so on. And so this vision of a landscape that was magical absolutely uh, in thrilled me. And we would go to Glastonbury Tour and do ceremonies on the tour. And uh, even though we were, there was just a small group of us at that time, uh, it, was, it was inspiring. And so I began to study. And, um, and what I learned is that uh, within this tradition, there are three streams, three streams within Druidry. And the place that you learn about Druidry is the sacred grove. It's the clearing in the forest. It's a place that we can imagine ourselves in now, out in, outside, with trees around us, rooted deeply in the soil, stretching up into the sky. And you come into that sacred grove, and if you don't happen to have a handy sacred grove nearby, all you need to do is just imagine that you have one. And this becomes a sacred place, a place from which you can journey, a place where you can come back to your center, and a place where you can learn. Because the wonderful thing about this whole thing that we're doing, this way, the spiritual way, is that it's based upon the idea that Everything can teach us, the land can teach us, the trees can teach us, and that there are spirits and beings in this 96% that the scientists can't uh, work out what's going on. In this 96%, there are all these wonderful energies and beings and learnings for us to learn about. And so let's go into that first uh, grove, of the, uh, grove of the bards now. Let's sense ourselves there. And this is a place where we learn about, we start to learn about druidry. Druid, by the way, is made up of these two syllables, and it's all there in a nutshell. Dru and id, these two syllables, both from Proto-Indo-European language roots. Dru, meaning trees, and specifically the oak. 
Id meaning wisdom, knowledge, understanding. And these are connotative words, not denotative words. I didn't know about the distinction, but it's very important that you know about it. Because when you go to the dentist, you do not want him to use connotative words. You want him to use, him to use denotative words. Denotative words denote specific things. Pass me the drill, pass me the crown, pass me the glue, and so on. You want him to use those. When you go to the poetry recital that evening, you'd like the poet to use connotative words, words that evoke, that associate. You don't want the dentist using those kind of words. So connotative, drew and id, connotative words. So we have oak, tree, forest, nature, id, wisdom, understanding. It's where our word witness comes from as well. So put them together and you have the forest sage, the oak seer, the, uh, the, the knower of nature. Forest sage, it's a one, wonderful, wonderful image. And so how does the forest sage learn? How does the forest sage connect to this tradition that was there before Druidry appeared, before the Druids appeared on the land? As the ice sheets moved away and the tribes came uh, from the southwest, which gives us the hint about the Indo-European connection, because there's this fantastic connection with the traditions of the East. Too long to go into now, but we have a project called the One Tree Project, if you look on our website, where we meet up with Hindus and Buddhists and Jains in order to explore this. So these tribes were coming across, perhaps through the Caspian Sea, and so on, all sorts of different directions. Finally, as the ice sheets went, coming to these lands, uh, connecting with the powers of light and darkness, with the sun and the moon, the mystery, finally, in the last analysis, the mystery of the relationship between darkness and light. That's the core mystery between darkness and light. The mystery of a child, it's lovely that we've got a baby here, this little baby emerging out of the darkness of the womb into the light. The mystery of the seed placed in the soil that emerges out of the darkness into the light. And so the first religious acts, if you like, were replications of that, where we'd go into the cave, into the darkness, and sit in the darkness. I reckon, nobody knows, but I reckon it was three days and three nights, long enough to almost think you're going mad, uh, but not quite so long as you really do go mad. But there's this tradition that, you know, if somebody sits on a barrow, and I'm sure it was if they went into a cave as well, is that you either go mad, you'll become a poet, or you'll become, um, or you'll die, I think. And, you know, so, and then you emerge out of the cave, and you're born into the light. So it's this relationship between darkness and light. And so, and so, and, and that in relation to the land. So in the end, the, the great cairns are built, the barrows like Newgrange, uh, you know, facing the rising sun, where the gods were invoked into the land. We are so used to this idea of the veil, if you like, or the other world, and of our attempts to get to it. You know that time, you know, when you meditate or you do a journey, and it's like, bonk, 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 like that. And, and you're like some old sort of car, and it doesn't quite sort of, you know, when it doesn't work, it doesn't quite work. You know, you don't quite get through to the other side, or you meditate, and you can't quite kind of get into it and so on. And, you know, because we're always trying to go over there. But what was happening with the ancients, I think, is that they were also inviting the gods in. It's a two-way process. It's not just about going over there into the other world and communing and then coming back. The traditional definition, not the traditional, the Michael Harner's sort of definition of shamanism in a, in a nutshell. It's technology or techniques to go into the other world, get something, and come back. It's not just that. It's also about inviting those beings who are out there in, which is how we started. Oh, spirits of the East, please come and bless us and help us. Please come and so on. So, so there's a two-way traffic going on, this liminal world. So here we are in the, in the Grove of the Bards. And what are, what, are, what are we learning? We're learning about how we can realize our potential, how we can sing the song that is inside us, that wants to come out. You know that predominant feeling we can have is that, that we haven't quite realized our potential. 
you know. It starts from a young, young child. It started for me probably when I was, I don't know, six or something, you know, the, the school report. He has so much potential. You know, it's a pity that he spends, you know, the classes playing with his friends. You know, he's, you know, so there's always this, and it carries on into your adult life, doesn't it? If only there's sort of kind of something, what do I need to do to be really myself? I've often felt that I need to throw pots of paint around, huge canvases, you know, let it all out like that. And of course, singing is, is, a, is a wonderful way. That's why it's so lovely to start, Kathleen, with the, with the singing uh, this morning, because that's, that's helping us do exactly that. That's what voice work does. If you ever get a chance to do some voice work with somebody, it's fantastic because it really works in this way. Emerson came out with this uh, concept of the uh, undersong. He, he sort of made up a word um, called the undersong. This idea that it's bubbling like a sort of underground stream, and that's, that's the, the expression that we want to, to, we want to give. So, so in, in, uh, in the Grove of the Bards, we learn how we can express our particular undersong that may be actually in song, or it may be in words, it may be in craft, it may be in art, it may be just in the way we are in the world, in our unique and particular way. But traditionally, it turns around the voice, which is why Druidry in the old days was an oral culture, because it all turns around this ability that only we seem to have as incarnated beings. Animals, of course, they do have voices, of course, bird song, and I remember a dog that used to be able to sing a song who was just fantastic. Uh, but, it, but language is something that's particularly human. And so it's about story, it's about learning the power of the old stories, and it's also learning about, for us, the way we've done, the way we work with it in the, in the order that I work with is we take all this material and we say, well, it's not just about reconstructing it or attempting to do what people did thousands of years ago because things have moved on. So what we try to do is we try to integrate, integrate a modern psychological understanding, a spiritual psychological understanding into it. So, so, and this is something that is really good to do, I think, in any when you come across any tradition, any technique, is to ask yourself, oh, that sounds, that's really interesting. Does psychology illuminate this and add something to this? So if you take an understanding of psychology into the, the power of story, it's, it's obvious straight away. You know, whole uh, work in psychotherapy is around story. And my dad used to tease me that as I, when I was working as a psychotherapist that it was what he called money for old rope. Because essentially, you know, a big amount of work was encouraging somebody to tell their story. Just creating a kind of atmosphere and a relationship where the story can come out and then more layers and more layers and so on. And so this is the work of the bard, the work, which is a work fundamentally of magic because there's a way in which words have a power. And you can see this in an esoteric sense in terms of vibrations and of the effect that they have. And you can see it in a very mundane way in, in the simple fact that if I say no to you, your life, well, my, maybe, depending on what's asked, uh, imagine asking somebody, a very important, you ask somebody if, if they'll marry you, will you marry me? No. Yes. And your life is going to go in that direction or it's going in that, that direction. It's just two letters put together, or three in the case of yes, like that. So words, extremely powerful, fantastically powerful. And not only words, but silence too. There's something about the dynamic relationship between words and silence, between the song and the music and the pauses in between that deepens and enriches us. And in our world that is so full of noise and chatter, that's why retreats are important. That's why spiritual gatherings are important. That's why it's good to come together. I always feel, I don't know about you, but I feel like you know when Emma began the meditation uh, this morning, you think, ah, oh, there's this fantastic feeling of relief with just this little pool of silence to bathe in. And then our guide in this grove of the bards where there's somebody playing the harp, there are people singing, and there are teachers working with us to help us 
articulate our, our, our deep story, our deep song. And then our guide uh, turns to us and says, but you know there are other groves in, in the Druid tradition. There are other groves. There's the, groves, the grove of the Ovates and the grove of the Druids. And so let's just listen to a little bit of song as we move from the grove of the Bards to the grove of the Ovates, to the grove of the Druids. We're going to go straight to the grove of the Druids. Oh, Here we are in the grove of the Druids. This is the grove where we open to the sage within us. In the grove of the bards, we were opening to the singer within us, the creative self, working with our potential. Here, we're working with the sage within. Here, in the training that, uh, that, that, that we do now, we work with philosophy and ethics. Sounds very dry, but it's not. Uh, we work with the ceremony, with initiation, with uh, rites of passage, and with cultivating wisdom. And we work with the relationship between knowing and uncertainty. A relationship as important as the relationship between sound and silence. The whole stress in our world is towards knowing, all our education, all of science. There's this kind of wall of, which is conceived of as the wall of ignorance, that science and medicine, quite naturally in a way, because that's its agenda, it attacks, let's attack this. So when you find out there's 96% you don't understand, you build this massive Hadron Collider thing over sort of kilometers and pour in millions of pounds of push across this wall. But but one of the key ideas, I think, that we work with is that sense of mystery that says to us, you can't understand everything. It's a good thing you can't understand everything. Be open. Be uncertain. The other way, the way of trying to be certain, which is so seductive, is the way of fundamentalism. No, I know, and I'm right. And when you think you're right, you're backed against the wall and you've got nowhere else to go. So however much a contrary evidence is presented to you, you can't go anywhere. But it seems to me that it's vital to be able to step into the realm of uncertainty, to appreciate the mystery, to, to be in a state of unknowing. And in that way, something can enter into your life just as it enters into us when we sit in the silence. And it's interesting to note, I think, that in this grove of the Druids, where we see Druidesses and Druids sitting, perhaps with people teaching, conversing, discussing, connecting with the land, connecting with the spirits of, of nature and of the other world. It's important to note, I think, that it's all working on the principle that we are cultivating wisdom more than we are seeking enlightenment. And that's a very interesting distinction because you know the way in many Eastern traditions, enlightenment is seen as the sole goal, really, the most important goal because uh, enlightenment resolves everything, if you like. That's the goal to have. But there's a huge problem that that brings with it, which is 
that immediately you take it on board, for most of us, I think, but as soon as one takes it on board, it's an event that hasn't occurred yet. Um, and therefore, it's in the future, it's something you're aspiring to, which is, of course, wonderful, but it's not here and now, and therefore, you have to seek it, and you're not in the ideal, con in, in the ideal state. So by definition, you're in an imperfect state trying to reach perfection. And this is a problem that faces all of us humans in psychology, it's called provisional living, which is uh, the tendency we have to say, I will be happy, I'll feel fulfilled, everything will be all right, when? When I get married, when I get divorced, when I get the job, when I leave the job, when I leave London, when I get to London. Uh, you know, and it just goes on and on. When I've had the next, you know, for me, it's when I've had lunch, you know. And, 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 you know, everything will be all right once I can have a decent meal. And, 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 and our lives are a continuous kind of provisional living. And, uh, and then, of course, we set ourselves up because we think, you know, um, you know, it'll all be great when the kids leave home. And then, uh, you know, the day after they've left, they come back with the grandchildren. And they said, look, I'm pregnant, you know, and uh, can we come and live here? Or whatever it is, it's never, life is never the way you plan it. So that's the trouble with seeking the goal of enlightenment is it sets up um, provisional living for us. Notice how it feels for you now if you, if you think, okay, I'm, I'm maybe striving for enlightenment uh, creates some kind of stress for me. What if I decide to cultivate wisdom instead? Immediately, immediately there's a kind of sense of relaxing where your soul can breathe. There's a suggestion that it's already there. It just needs cultivating. It's growing. With all, you, know, you see the wisdom in a little child. Uh, you see, you, there's a sense of the wisdom of the body, the wisdom of nature. It's something that immediately evokes gardening images, agricultural images, uh, cultivation, growing, slow, maturation, and so on. And, and so we work, we work with wisdom. The idea of enlightenment is in Druidry. The key stories of Taliesin who gets splashed with three drops, or Finn McCool who gets the three drops of salmon liquor and... and Sucks, they suck their thumbs in Wales and in Ireland, and they, they, they are filled with illumination. The Druid is sometimes symbol, symbolized as the lightning-struck oak. So there is the idea of enlightenment in it, but, but perhaps, but, but more stress, certainly in the type of Druidry that we teach, that, we, that there's more stress on the cultivation of wisdom. So we're sitting in this, in this grove, and we think this is, this is very nice, but then... Our guide says, well, this is just a little taste of, of the Druid tradition and of the riches that are in this heritage. And I'd like you to go now to the Grove of the Ovates. And so let's go to the Grove of the Ovates, and Catelyn will help us get there. So, in the Grove of the Ovates, we really start to tune in to the other world. It's important that we begin, I think, with developing ways that we're really grounded, working with the Eightfold Wheel of the Year, celebrating the solstices and the equinoxes, doing working with song, with poetry, with story. This is what we do to begin with, to, to really get ourselves grounded in community, in connection with culture. Because Druidry is shamanic, but it's more, it's, it's got a, a current of shamanism in it, but it's more than just shamanic. It's also a culture. 
for us stories and songs and music and community and celebration and rituals and festivals and so on. And uh, so, so, but by the time we, we start working with the Ovid, the Ovid's are people who work with the fluid nature of time and space. Nature itself exists in a matrix of time and space. And once one realizes the fluidity of that, that behind the apparent solidity of the natural world is a whole world of energies and forces, provided one has done that work of sufficient grounding, one can then start to work with traveling into these worlds, inviting spirits in, but also traveling into them as well. And so here we work with ways of journeying. And here we work too with a bodies, a, a body, bodies of law, L-O-R-E. So there is stone law and plant law, animal law, star law, and so on. And, and we work with these bodies of law, but rather than as collections of facts, for instance, if you have, uh, if you're familiar with tree law, for instance, there are lots of books which will give you just lots of associations and lots of facts. And it's very tempting just to grab a book and look it up. But actually, the way to do it is, and the way we teach in the order as well, is you develop a relationship with trees. You go and sit out under trees, and you spend time with them, and you meditate with them, and, and you connect with them. And then afterwards, you can look at the law that uh, has, has been passed down to us. And so there are all these bodies of law, but the prime stress is on experience and on nature. And in, in second place, scholarship, because Druidry is a scholarly pursuit as well, but ex experience needs to come uh, in first place. And David very kindly mentioned the uh, animal oracle and the plant oracle, and that's a way that, that Stephanie and I have found of conveying some of this law in a way that speaks to us in the, in the, in the 21st century. And in a way that combines the insights of psychology, and in particular transpersonal spiritual psychology, and, and, uh, and folklore uh, together. And so here it is that one learns too that the other world has its sacred geography, its lakes and islands, its landscapes that we can explore. And just as you'd be foolish to go into the physical world, into certain kinds of landscape without particular preparation, so it applies in inner world journeying as well, which is why training and mentorship is important, because this other world is vast. And so, little by little, you've built up by now this real sense of your own inner grove through your training in uh, the Grove of the Bards, and this becomes a sort of liminal, it's a way station between the worlds. And that's really what many sacred sites and PowerPoints are. There's a way in which all the earth is sacred, and there's also a way in which, just like with the human body, there are lines of energy through the land, and there are particular points, sacred sites and power points, where they act as portals or gateways, where somehow it's easier to travel into the other world. And a way of looking at it, I, I don't know, I guess, you know, a lot of you will have this experience of flying. So let's use that as an analogy. You know, uh, with flying, uh, you have what's called ground side and air side. And never the twain shall meet. Well, well they do meet, but, it, but with security. So you have, you know, so you come into an airport and you're ground side. And uh, rather strangely, ground side has become rather dangerous now because that's where they can't control the security. And so there have been various incidents recently, haven't there, with things blowing up in airports and things like that. So you're on ground side, 
and you go through security, and then you're on our side. And everybody you meet is on our side. So the guy working in the cafe, even though he's on minimum wages, he's been through security, and he's, he's crossed the veil, he's safe, and he's on our side. So these two worlds. And what you're doing is you're, the airport is the sort of transit station where you're moving from uh, one reality to another. And sacred sites, in a way, are like that. You, you come in ground side, you sit down, you maybe make an offering, you make a prayer, you open yourself up, and something falls away from you. You know, maybe it's your baggage. You leave your baggage behind. We have a, a saying in our Druid ceremonies, we, we leave outside all disturbing thoughts. And then we sort of step into the circle like that and drop everything. And then if you're lucky, you're, you, know, you meet people from our side who, who take you on. You go on a journey, you come back, and then you go back into this into the ground side again. And so let's leave that. It's so rich. You know, one of the things that, always faces me with these kind of events is there's so much to tell you about, there's so much to talk about, but time marches on. Because even though it's fluid, uh, it also, in the world we're living in now, it's also rigid. Uh, and so I'm going to move on, and I'm going to suggest that we come out of the ovate grove. And in order to do that, we're coming out of the ovate grove and back into this room. And so let's maybe stand up now, just because we've been sitting around for quite a while. And, and just, let's just jiggle, jiggle about a bit. Uh, sadly, I, I, I have to leave after this event because my mum isn't at all well, so I have to get back to, to Lewis. But a lot of you are going to be here all day and all day tomorrow as well, so these kind of things are terribly important, otherwise you'll sort of you know, seize up or... I would seize up anyway. Um, okay, thank you. And now we're back in this room here and sit down, jiggle a bit more if you want to, but um, because what I want to do is I want to um, show you an exercise that is essentially ovatic, which is why I, I took you uh, to the ovate grove uh, to give you a sense of it. Uh, the ovate uh, grove is the grove where uh, you work on we, you know, we talked about the Bardic Grove where you worked on your potential, your singing your song, Druid Grove where you worked on your wisdom, cultivating wisdom, the Ovate Grove is where you work on your connection and relationship with the land, with the spirits, and so on. And so, so here's an exercise from coming from that place, but it's, I'm going to present it to you in a very simple way that I feel is absolutely appropriate for this kind of setting, this kind of meeting, and um, which you will, you can use at any time, you can use it at home, and, and, and so on. Uh, when I say any time, it wouldn't be sensible to use it on the sort of London Underground, or, you know, uh, certain, certain places wouldn't be sensible, but, you know, when you're, when you're at home and peaceful. So, so this can be a little, little practice run, keeping that analogy of flying, it's like we're just going to go up in a little plane and come back down again, uh, but you know you can access this plane any time and, and go on a, a longer flight in your own time and all the rest of it. So let's just do it. And um, so it's based on this idea that uh, an understanding of the earth and the landscape as, as being able to give us gifts and us to develop and deepen our relationship with it. And there are sacred sites and special places all over the earth that act like these portals or these points of energy. And so to begin with, what, what, what you're going to do is just, what I'd suggest you do, is just think of somewhere you would like to visit. It could be anywhere in the world, uh, or it can be on these islands, that you would like to just visit, a sacred place that you would like to visit. And just open yourself to inspiration and get a place. If, you, if a place doesn't come to you, that's okay. You can try doing this and just see where you go as well. That's a possibility. And then I'd like to imagine, of course, this is best done when you're, when you're um, with, your, with your eyes closed. Um, just begin to relax into the chair. 
Feel the chair beneath you. Sense you've got the four walls around you, the floor beneath you, and the sky above you. And knowing that you can return to a full awareness of your physical surroundings at any time, you allow yourself to completely relax. You become aware of your eyes and all the muscles around your eyes relaxing. All the muscles in your head are relaxing now and around your mouth, just letting go as your awareness moves to your breathing in and out. And with every breath, you just become more relaxed. And you sense the chair that you're seated in. And imagine now that it's a very comfortable chair, really, really comfortable. And that in front of it, you're on your own, just with this comfortable chair. And in front of it is an old-fashioned globe that is slowly, tur slowly turning. And you see its wooden arm, the colors of the countries and the oceans as it slowly turns. And the arm of this globe melts away now. And you're looking at an image of the Earth herself turning on her axis as if you are far out in space gazing down on the planet. And you just relax and allow yourself to move towards it slowly until you feel that you're just at the right distance to gaze down on the planet. And you admire the beauty of this earth. And perhaps you sense two filaments of light that connect certain points on the planet. A great network or web of energy connecting every sacred site. And slowly the planet turns until you can see the country you want to visit far below you. And you sense yourself zooming in now, coming down and down towards the earth and towards the place you have decided to visit. And you gradually come to land just a little outside the place. Don't worry about trying to seeing, see anything. Just come to land and touch the ground. Imagine yourself touching the ground. And sense your fingers and now your palms resting on the earth. And because you're traveling in the imagination or what some may call the spirit or other world, this is a world of light and color and energy. So see if you can sense the energy of this place the pulse of the earth here. And now ask if you can go to the first gateway to this sacred site and see if, if you are drawn there effortlessly. Sometimes a guardian stands at such a gateway which you need to greet and request entry from. Sometimes you simply need to acknowledge your awareness of the threshold and then step over it if this feels right. And you go deeper towards the heart of this place and all that it offers. Sacred places are places of power that mediate specific frequencies of energy that are inspiring and healing. They are like pure springs high on the mountainside that invigorate and refresh you. So just allow yourself, if it feels right, to bathe in the energy at the heart of this place, bathing in the peace and the power to be found there.
And sacred places are also places of inspiration that can bring fresh ideas or guidance when we need it. This can come in the form of a message in words, in an image or symbol, or in a gift that is placed in your hands. If this place has a message for you in your life at this moment, be open now to receiving that message. And it's time to leave now, knowing you can return at any time. It is customary in holy places to make an offering, perhaps lighting a candle or leaving a flower or offering a food on an altar. Sense yourself making such an offering if this feels right. And then make your way to the gateway. Thank the guardian if one is there. Then turn to face in towards the place. Bow in appreciation. And then turn outwards and move away gradually. Drifting up in the air. Until you are looking down on the earth once again from high up in the air. Sense the earth turning until you see below you the familiar outline of Britain, London, far below. And then gradually come down, come down to land. See yourself coming back into the center of London, down into this room. Sensing the walls around you, the floor beneath you, the walls and the ceiling above you. You sense the uh, globe in front of you with its wooden arm. And even that starts to fade away as you become fully conscious of being seated here in this room, seated on the chair. Slowly you stretch your fingers and toes and when you feel ready, you open your eyes. And while the experience is still with you, I'd invite you just to, just to turn to the person you're seated with, and, and if you feel okay with doing this, just to share, each of you just share your journey. And the reason for that is it helps to bring you back into the room, and it helps you to remember little details that, that can very quickly drift away, and half an hour later you've forgotten them. So it helps to ground the experience, and it helps you to connect with whoever it is you're sitting with, and to hear about their adventure as well. So let's just do this for a couple of minutes. Okay. There's a lovely, a lovely hubbub of, 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 of talk. That, that sounds fun. Well, I hope, I hope that, um, was an interesting journey for you, and, and, and you see how um, you know, it took, I don't know, 15 minutes, I think. Um, so you can imagine how you can develop that and use it yourself. And, uh, and those of you who use Google Earth will know that, uh, that extraordinary way that you can actually do that, and you can sort of zoom, and you can go, I've been to the Potala Palace, for instance, which I've never visited physically, but I've sort of, you can fly up the Brahmaputra, and, you know, the resolution on, on the images for the Brahmaputra are very clear, actually, and if you set your sort of flight path for everyone, you can fly all the way up the Brahmaputra and, and get onto the Tibetan plateau, 
and then you can go around. And that's how I found the, the secret temple of the Dalai Lama, which is at the back. I flew around the Potala Palace, and there's a lake at the back with a, a building on it, and I thought, ooh, what's that? So having flown around, I flew back, and I, I went from Google Earth to, to, to Google, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and Googled palace around the back and found out about this wonderful palace which has tantric paintings, and it's, it's now open. You can visit it and so on. So, so, um, so this is a familiar kind of process for us, but I, but I think you know we can go quite deep with this. And um, so, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's uh, it's been lovely to to, to stand here because because you know there's the, the little baby there who's fast asleep now. There's a lovely Labrador here, and uh, a really lovely feeling of, of of joy in the room and colour. So, thank you. And to finish. Um, to finish our session, Carolyn Hillier will sing for us. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you. Actually, you're going to sing as well. <laughs> so would you like to stand up, please? We're going to do a bone song, and uh, we're going to do it in a, an ancient mother language that fed into all the Celtic languages. So it's words that would have resonated with our Bronze Age people. And the words of the chant, which you don't have to remember, because I'm going to do a line and then you do a line. Noibo nani, sacred grandmothers. Noibo wiru, sacred grandfathers. Asko no kajo, sacred bones. Asko no biwo, sacred breath or sacred life. Dijira kajo, sacred earth. Kruos kajo, sacred blood. So we're just going to do that as a response chant, but we're going to start with this. You're just going to call in these words, and as you do the first word, you're going to be sending it through the marrow of your bones so that you're filling up your bones with your ancestor people. And when you do the second word, you're bringing it up through the marrow of your bones, so you're filling your bones with the earth. So we start with that, and then we move into the chant. So I'll do it, and then you do it. Hey, yo. Joe, ask on no, Joe, ask on no. 
kajo bio kajo bio kajo noi bonani noi boero Nay, bow, wee. 